thanks everyone for joining. I will reference and say that this is my first um, conference I'm doing virtually. So I I think I hope I do okay. But if I don't or you can't hear me at any time, of course I'm I have a I'm watching the chat window. So you know ask questions um, and I'll kind of like respond as quickly as I can. Um, so with that, I'm just kind of going to get started. Um, all right. So um, my name is, just to kind of give you a little bit information about me, I, I briefed it earlier. Um, my name is Ijoma Ezunyapuchi. I have my phonetics on the slides. Um, I currently work as a test engineer, so that means I'm primarily focused on automation. Um, right now, I'm working on our API services team. Previously, I worked on mobile applications and enterprise software as well. So I'm kind of transitioning from customer-facing software to more, um, I guess, back-end-facing software. But um, it's still very useful stuff. And I think a lot of the lessons I kind of learned, kind of focusing on more things that consumers see, such as websites and mobile applications, I think are very useful to everyone. So I'm gonna, just going to share a couple of those tips. Um, the talk is very informal, um, and there is an opportunity to participate, so I do encourage you to use the chat. Um, again, if there are any questions or um, you're lost at any point, please let me know, and then I'll be sure to adjust. All right, so it all starts with kind of a testing realization story. Um, a few years ago, uh, a few... Um, a few years ago, I um, uh, presented a talk um, called Break Things to Fix Things. Um, the talk kind of focused on a few topics. So a lot, it talked a lot about how um, testing can be used as part of the um, testing workflow. And what I mean by that, um, it talked about how in a typical agile workflow, you will have like a planning phase where you're kind of deciding what you're going to build. Um, you'll have a development phase where you're writing code, um, some type of testing or QA, UAT phase. And then if everything looks great, you'll kind of go ahead and release. That is the tip, like in terms of my practice and what I've worked on, this is what I typically tend to see. Um, but in terms of what might be a better way to kind of do this process is that like what I found with previous processes that like kind of waiting till everything is built and trying to figure out what you're testing, how it should work, and if you have enough coverage is a lot harder. And it's actually a lot easier to kind of start um, at this initial phase of thinking, how can I make QA part of the entire process? So can you ask questions during planning to kind of determine like what you're supposed to build and how it should look? Um, when you're doing development, can you start writing unit tests there? Or can you even ask yourself, am I writing code for something that can actually can be tested? Um, in terms of testing phase, um, what I actually learned is that while we write a lot of, we write manual tests and automation tests at NPR, what I found is as we kind of go through, like typically our manual tests that we have automated tests, like when we get close to release, we find that they're very stable, but kind of like introducing exploratory testing. So that's more of just kind of like, you know, testing around random things, seeing what works, what doesn't, without any specific goal in mind, we find a lot of bugs and things that we don't initially plan for. So keeping opportunity or room inside of your testing practice to allow for everything not to be so standard, we actually learned a lot more things that we were not focusing on earlier in the process. And then, um, the last kind of part of the process is like if everything looks good, release being ship quality things. So kind of asking yourself the question when we release is like, when I finally release this out into the wild, is it that I'm just kind of releasing it and letting it go or is there more follow-up needed? You know, I think this is actually the most important part, especially if you're working on automation, if you put tests out there, like how do you ensure it's kind of working consistently? Um, as I presented this talk, um, those are actually just a few slides and a few snippets. There are a few questions that I got very often. Um, one being, um, how do I prove the value of testing? People didn't seem to have an issue agreeing that it is important to have testing in your practice somewhere. And this seemed to resonate, of course, with QA, but also with product and developers who I spoke to. Um, and sometimes also hearing stories such as, you know, we no longer have a QA team. Um, and developers are responsible for all the testing. What do I do? Which I actually kind of find interesting. Um, we do have a dedicated QA resources where I work right now, but I know that's not always the case. And so there are cases where developers are responsible to do all testing. 
Um, then this kind of led to the sad realization. Um, I don't even know what I'm testing, which is probably surprising. You might think that if you're coming from more of a developer or DevOps background, maybe you built it. So you have knowledge about what it is, like whatever you built. So you should know how to write a test. But in my experience, just in terms of writing apps for fun that were not necessarily for work, I might you know, write code to build something just so I can build something, but not be focusing so much on like what I'm trying to focus on testing afterwards. So it's a little bit harder to go full circle. So this question, I don't even know what I'm testing. is kind of what I'm looking to explore today. So in kind of a process to kind of figure out, could I better answer this question? I kind of did two parts. I kind of, as I attended these different conferences, I looked to see what topics people who are bringing forward in terms of things to consider and uh, what are some important other teams and other companies. But also I looked internally to see like, what am I doing at work to kind of answer these questions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, some of the things I heard um, kind of um, keeping a reference that I'm more working on the automation testing side is automation is the future and manual testing is slow. Um, and in my experience, I will tell you, even working more in terms of automation, I don't have a preference in terms of like test engine, like automation is the best or real testing is terrible. I personally believe whatever works for your situation is what works for your situation. Um, but the issue here was, um, or I would also even hear this, um, how to use blank testing framework to improve your testing efforts. And I've also done talks about different testing frameworks. So when I give you this information, I'm not saying discluding myself from the one who gives similar talks and topics. And I want to reference that this is to talk about, is this actually a bad thing? Is it bad to talk about automation being a future or the state of manual auto testing or how to improve via testing framework? I mean, not necessarily. It's not a bad thing to talk about automation frameworks or tools. Um, it's more about the fact that it's kind of the wrong question to be asking. Um, the fact about automation is the future or mail testing is, sorry, these slides. Um, it's not a bad thing. It's just that these don't answer the correct questions. So automation being the future of manual testing don't answer the original questions I pose. And that is how do you prove the value of testing and kind of how do you determine what to test? I mean, when you look out there, you can see so many different tools that can kind of use for testing. Kind of talking in more of like a mobile trend. These are some of the ones I've used or heard of. Um, Appium, Selenium, Espresso, XC test, um, Postman if you're doing API testing. Um, Excel sheet just for writing test cases and maybe a manual test tracker. I kind of want to influence here that when I say um, um, a tool, I pretty much just mean anything that kind of allows you to write a test. And further on, that kind of leads me to my first lesson, and that is tools do not dictate what you test. They just make it possible for you to write tests. So the reason I want to emphasize this point is a lot of times as we are, you know, creating a new feature or we're creating something new, we like someone asks, maybe a product manager says, how will we test that? Like, what will we test? If they ask about the how, you can, of course, you can mention a framework, you can mention a testing tool. If they ask about the what, the answer is never going to be an automation framework. An automation framework is exactly that. It's a framework that allows you to write tests, but will never dictate what you can actually, it will never dictate what's important for testing. And so like with that kind of said, um, I want to kind of walk us through two examples of trying to determine a good test in terms of like what I might consider internally. And these could apply to your applications as well. Uh, so here we go. So here I have a product case. Um, I want to build a sign-in form. Um, so imagine a product manager, project manager comes to you as like a tech professional or someone who's designing or building something and says, I really want to build something. Right. Um, the question I have for you, and I'd like you to kind of answer with the chat, is uh, what are some test cases that you might write given this um, given this product case? And I'll give you like maybe a minute or two to kind of like um, type a couple of possible answers in the chat.
All right, I've got I've given a few, maybe you know, ten to fifteen more seconds to maybe get a few more. All right, so kind of reading um, a few of the comments that have been answered, that have been given to me, I've gotten things such as validating the form, checking which fields are active, um, testing that the user field, um, uh, user fills in the correct um, email and password, um, what characters are allowed and disallowed. And these are all great answers that they are things that you want to test. You're testing things about the sign-in form. But I was I would say this. Essentially, a lot of those cases stem from uh, the specific case. The most important case to test, right, is that a user can actually sign in. Like that is the purpose of a sign-in form, that you want to make sure that a user can actually sign in. And a lot of the cases that you gave, that you presented, such as validating fields and validating different input fields, making sure that you know passwords work, um, checking the character links, they kind of all go into kind of reinforce that. So when you're thinking about how to stem your test case, where how to create your test or where they're kind of coming from, you should really be thinking about like, what is the product value that you're trying to deliver? And the reason I enforce this is because I think I find sometimes, especially kind of working more with APIs, I can kind of get stuck in a world of trying to make sure I test every single, make sure we get 100% test coverage, make sure everything has, um, everything is tested and that we encounter everything. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to, uh, you know, um, validate is ensuring that you can actually do what you're like, you can do the main function that the application is built for. Um, with that in mind, I think I have uh, so I have one more case. Um, I think you might have just seen the answer. <laughs> um, but um, so the next case I have is um, I want to display the weather. And so maybe with that again, um, if you can kind of give me a few, uh, based off kind of the previous answer, like what you think the most important case might be for this product case. Yeah, so I'm getting a couple of the answers that roll in. They're kind of what I expect, right? So I would say that if I was thinking about a high level use case I'm trying to meet, it would be um, that user can view the weather. And these ones kind of, uh, the, most of the answers, I think most of the answers I got are all on like, around the same thing of saying that um, you all are saying that you want to make sure that you can find today's weather and that you can uh, make sure the correct weather is displayed and you're correct right so like when this kind of brings me to the second case i kind of want to emphasize and that is good test cases are centered around the user and what i mean by that is that the examples that you've given are are all largely based off what you want a user to, to be able to do right you want a user to like if you're creating an application that's about showing the weather you want to make sure that you can actually view the weather if you're creating a site in form you want to make sure a user can sign in and then that probably brings me to the next thing i know this is something that i see very often about the testing pyramid but what about something like this right like um you have to have you know this talks a lot about how you should break out your tests. so this is more of a mobile example right about you want to have a small amount of ui tests um a like the middle layer being integration and a large amount of unit test and how does this kind of apply to the previous lesson well i think it actually still applies in this case it's just like this is more about a framework example right so like i think a lot of times people might say when they're talking about testing strategy Let's make sure we have really great unit coverage. Let's make sure we have good integration coverage. We don't want to spend a lot of time on UI tests. Maybe they're not influential. Like whatever you might kind of come up with as an example about, should you be focusing on this? Is it actually important? Is it really impactful? The reality is that this all still holds true. This just kind of gives you focus, right? Looking at the previous case of like, you know, you want a user to display the weather um, and look at this pyramid, you might kind of say, 
for UI testing, that might be in a, a, a you know, Appium or Selenium test. I'm not trying to be prescriptive where you kind of just say that like, I want to verify that there is a field that shows weather, right? For an integration test, you might want to verify that given um, the specific response, like you kind of get this piece of data. And for a unit test, you might just want to verify that like, um, get, if I like, does a specific, you know, function or method that kind of like verifies that you can give an output of whether it even exists, does it work? Does it actually give an output, right? So in that case, you can kind of like put your test cases in the frame of saying that you can still ensure and still assume that you can actually get there. You can still make sure that your tests are user driven. And so I know at this point, some people might be thinking about what, what about 100% test coverage? Like I do agree, great test coverage is important, but I think focus for your test is important as well. Um, what are some other ways to kind of verify or look to see like where you should be kind of getting data about what your test cases should be? Um, so kind of looking at the data, I would say, look at things like analytics. If you have analytics available to you about a product, I would say, look at analytics to see what your users are actually doing. I often find that when I look at analytics or um, if I've looked at uh, app reviews or comments on the websites, for instance, and previous employer, like we could actually just ask our client, because I work as a consultant, like, do you have analytics around the ability to, um, take some of these actions and then they would tell us like we see this most often that most often and those are things that you want to test because they have high product value um, things like app reviews i think i have seen a tendency kind of like while i was working on the mobile teams and i would review the comments on the app store and the play store is that when things are not working or when there are issues around a specific um, specific module or specific feature that users are not shy to comment about how they do not like something not working. So if you see a trend of reviews saying that something is not working, that is not only that doesn't only indicate an issue of like um, this is not working. That can also indicate an issue of maybe just maybe that you don't have great test coverage around a specific feature. So one practice that we kind of take at heart here is that if we see that like there are consistent feedback around a specific feature not working as expected, and this is more of not the case of products and user experience, but more of the cases like we literally just something just fails all the time. In that case, we'll actually use us as an example to say like, you know, we see that this specific module is really not working for some reason and we don't know why, but people consistently say it's not working. So like we need to increase test coverage and making sure that the end, um, those end use cases that the user is experiencing are actually being covered somewhere. Um, and thing is like, why does it matter? Um, I think it matters because one thing I see, and this is probably more practice of automation, but I've also seen manual testing as well, is that with testing, I think that there's a strong desire to cover everything. And I inherently kind of have the strong desire to cover everything. But I think sometimes that can lead to unreliable tests. I've seen more times than I would like the experience of where maybe a test fails, right? And the response is like, let's just rerun it. Or if we're testing, if we're in a manual testing session, I might test something, someone else might test something, and we have different responses, and then we'll have like a third person test it. And then the response of what they see is kind of like, okay, well, you know, they tested it, and it kind of works for more of them, like, we think we're good, we have great coverage. So like, we kind of think that maybe this is a blip. And like, the reality is that that list leads to unreliable tests, and we don't believe something is actually going to be carried out. The thought about stressing the wrong things, I can it can be can be very easy if you're the one who works on the implementation to um, focus in too much deeply on like every single button has to be checked, everything needs to be working. If that's not something that a user will oversee or has high product value, then maybe um, focusing more on where the high product values to the users is better um, overall. And also it's easier to advocate for long long term value. So I've seen a lot of times where it seems that there is a disconnect between development and product. And so when there is that disconnect, um, I think one way to kind of go about it is saying like, if you think about the user, the, the earlier use case about the ability to uh, write tests um, for a sign-in form. Like it's very easy to kind of talk to a product um, or project manager and kind of say that I, I'm very sure that we have, I'm very sure that the sign-in functionality works because we have a test that we can see repeatedly works. The test is the ability to sign in. So it, de it delivers that value that we were talking about earlier. And kind of more into a recap, um, how do I prove the value of testing? Tie it, you can prove the value of testing by, again, tying it to a business goal or a use case. Um, and then how do you determine what to test? 
um, kind of you determine what's a test by um, kind of picking the test cases from that use case. And so, and I also do want to stress that this doesn't mean that we're not testing the bare minimum. Like, you know, like I would also say a use case might be, you know, if you have, if you're an API that's being consumed by a client, I would say a use case is ensuring that that client contract is working. Like that is a very important use case. Because if not, like you're not delivering the value that was promised if you're working more on the services side. So I'd say in that case, ensuring that every single, um, that might be verifying that a client receives expected fields. That is a use case that's important because that is actually part of the business contract. And I see that more in terms of APIs. So just kind of recap of like how to improve overall value is making sure that everything is kind of tied back to a specific purpose and value. And if you find yourself in a case where you're writing a test case and you're saying, I don't even know why I'm doing this or what I really want it to do, then I always encourage you to kind of go back to like, what is the original thing I'm trying to build and how does writing those tests add value to that? Um, I think I, that actually might be it. And so I think with that, I'll just kind of open it up for questions. Thank you. Any questions? You can post your questions in Q&A section. And I think everybody can associate with the importance of testing particularly now. That pyramid, I think, was very interesting because it determines how multi-layered the testing is because you're testing for different areas, different parts. Yeah, I think I find the pyramid interesting because I see it presented very often in testing blocks as in terms of like, this is what you should have, but now how you determine what's on every layer. So I think that kind of the breaking it out by just kind of like saying like, how does each layer, you know, add value to a specific use case kind of can give you like a rough guideline. So you're not over or under testing what you're trying to deliver. There is one question in Q&A, uh, new to testing. Any tips on reading or videos to get a handle on basics, basics of this? Oh, I'm, I'm actually seeing the questions now. Um, mm -hmm. um, I can't, so I actually didn't really go through any formal kind of testing training. I think it's more of, uh, I learned every kind of company has their own practice um, in terms of what I might recommend. And I also, but I would say that versus when I started versus now there's actually just a lot more information out there online. So in terms of what I might recommend, I will say it depends on whether or not you are trying to get into more of like the manual side of testing or the automation side of testing. And I would say if you're trying to get into more of the manual side of testing, my best recommendations would actually be to just kind of download a whole bunch of different apps and actually kind of like walk through the entire application, like pay attention to details and add and like note, note take like what you notice working and what you notice not working because that is actually a large part of manual testing. It is being is having a strong attention to detail. And that applies to automation testing as well. But if you don't have the strong attention to like looking into the service or asking questions about why that's hard. Um, it's going to be harder for you to kind of like grow in that field. Um, number two, I would say is never be afraid to ask questions in QA. I ask questions to practically everyone. And that means whether you are a product, you are DevOps, you are a developer, like I will ask questions to everyone because what I find a lot of times is that by asking questions, we usually find bugs, right? So ask questions early and often. Um, and so in terms of, so yeah, I haven't really done a lot of readings. I think I just kind of like Google in terms of like resources, in terms of videos, um, I would recommend, um, I've gone through part of like, there's a Linda um, learning path on like being a QA engineer that I thought has some pretty good tips. And so if you are in the US, most public libraries have access to Linda for free. So that is like a free resource. I would also recommend um, looking into Test Automation University. It's like a, it's a whole bunch of video courses, short courses on different tools and technologies that are kind of relevant today. Um, and if you're also looking to um, focus more on the, um, how would I say it? If you're looking to focus more on the automation side of things, um, I would just say familiarity in like one programming language is okay. 
Um, and the, I just mean basic familiarity. So like that could be JavaScript, that could be Java um, or Python. One of those three are most likely what you're going to be using to write to be writing tests. So that would be my recommendation. So I would say for manual side of it, like just kind of going through and testing a lot of apps and just kind of like having a keen attention to detail in terms of the automation side, looking at things like test automation and Lenda, they have like um, paths of data. So I can kind of follow those video courses to kind of get a good sense of where to kind of go from there. Uh, there was a question from Nikolai. Did you answer the one? I, I read it, but I realized that I got disconnected for a second. Yep, I'm going to read the next one. So the next one is, do you think that testing is useful in a project phase where things are largely undefined and prone to change? Um, that's actually kind of like the the previous project I worked on mobile team like maybe four years ago that's kind of a lot where that's kind of where we were at like things were very largely undefined and I want to say yes in different ways so I think um, we did like a lot of like kind of ad hoc random testing and I think it is important because I think you learn more about your project and how to incorporate it later. I think what you're going to find in the early project phase is that it's a lot harder to have a specific amount of time where you can kind of just like sit down and like do full testing all day or like make sure all things work and get approval like that. Typically, if you're in the environment of like I've done nonprofit work, so like helping like um, volunteering to help nonprofits and such, it's a lot harder to kind of get that in stone. But I do believe that like you should still do testing and testing doesn't necessarily need to mean that you are writing automated tests or manually going through an application and testing it. It might literally just mean that you can ask for more clarification during discovery. So if you're in the early project phase, I found a lot of times asking questions such as, you know, where are we going to put that code? You know, for instance, um, it's helpful because sometimes we, we learn that like if we develop in a specific way that it will hinder other teams. Right. So for an example at work, like a few years ago, we wanted to create a pilot feature and we wanted to put it in our backend services. Um, but if you put it in our backend services, every client would have consumed that information and it would have caused bugs across like four to five, you know, like live clients out in production. So like that's a case where like even though what we were building at that time was largely undefined, simply asking questions about what it's supposed to do can kind of help reduce the amount of bugs that you see out there um, in public, which I think is really important. Um, and prone to change. So I think the prone to change more applies to like things such as like writing tests, whether that's mail tests or automation tests. Um, I would say that it's the same thing about it has to be a different implementation. So what I mean by that is that when you're writing manual tests, I would say keep them kind of rough if you know your project is prone to change. And even though that's not the maybe the best answer is I find that like in the cases where things are prone to change, I would find myself updating test cases very frequently all the time. But I found like if we are iterating to make things kind of somewhat open to interpretation, but still within the reason of like what you're trying to test. Because what I found is that gives me two values. It gives me like the exploratory side of it. So people kind of doing things that we're not necessarily predicting for, but still testing the checks of what we want to. And then as, as things are more refined, that's when I'll have the test cases more refined and automation testing as well. All right. Um, so um, the next question from Connor was, in what ways is mobile testing different or even more challenging than other kinds of testing? Um, I would say it's different in many ways and challenging because I find, um, so the first thing I found with mobile testing is that it's a lot more predictable now, but previously it was not very predictable. Um, I think when I first started using Appium, there were a lot of like things that were not so great about it. Sometimes it couldn't necessarily access certain elements in the screen. Um, and also, and I would not only say this about Appium, I would say that was true of every testing framework. And this was maybe around 2015, 2016, that like the testing frameworks that were meant to be there for testing, like were not the greatest ones to be using because they didn't always seem to be very reliable. I also found that there's also the cases of like, versus like when I did web previously is that for mobile development, there is a new OS update every single year. Like that is guaranteed. And I know it's different for web, but like what it literally means for mobile is that that can either change implementation or deprecate APIs pretty immediately. And it is, and I think the difference is 
you might have a legacy system and in, in whatever with the background service that you can probably keep version at a specific version for a long amount of time. But the difference with mobile is that you don't really have that ability to kind of just say that we're going to use an old version of this API infinitely. Because for instance, on iOS, every single year, that is like a new upgrade for a new system. So you have to update to be using the latest things. And for Android, why it's slower, that is also very important. So like one thing I found hard, hardest with mobile testing is kind of keeping up to date. Also, the fact with mobile is that there are just more parameters of things that people could be doing that you're not planning for, right? Like we, I think I remember us trying to test a bug that to do with when another app was opened, like there was some issue with our application and it was just hard to replicate. So we were just kind of like me and a lead dev just were walking around the building, trying to figure out if we could get like a, a, a dead spot to kind of test this scenario. I was like, you're more likely to come across things that you would probably never experience on your own mobile device when you're doing mobile testing. And depending on the severity of those things, it can lead to a very positive or pretty negative user experience. Um, and also the fact that mobile interacts with many things. So mobile testing could be a mobile app, it could mean mobile web, it could mean a progressive web app. And depending on the technology, you have different constraints and maybe you have like um, an external part. Like for instance, sometimes there's a place to have like an Android extension or you could have like um, a smartwatch app. So that's also part of your mobile testing platform, something you need to add. So the biggest thing I would say is the fact, the biggest, the biggest struggle with mobile testing, I would say is keeping up. So the technology has advanced. And I think that if you're using Appium or Espresso or XC test, that will get you a large, a large amount of the way in terms of like automated testing. In terms of manual testing, there's a lot of cloud devices out there. For instance, I know like one thing that I've used in the past is browser stack is good if you just kind of want to like test other devices without actually having other devices. So there are a lot of tools and technologies out there to help you. But I think like the largest thing that you're going to find is that there's a lot of scenarios. So this is a case where I would kind of say work with work with your product manager if you have a data team. If not, and you can if you're doing mobile, I would say just kind of check your app store and play store comments to see what people are doing and kind of use that to inform where you focus your testing efforts. All right. And I want to go to the last question I think I've gotten here was, um, are there any specific things to pay attention when testing APIs? How to identify API issues other than testing work by HTTP success or failure codes? That's actually a good question. And that's something I've been working on a lot recently. Um, so I think I initially for SGI, I was mostly just testing success or failures. Um, and I think one guiding principle I've kind of had in terms of more of the functional side of it is, you know, like, um, other than testing like status codes, I've also started just kind of testing, you know, like, for instance, if it's an API and you are testing a query for a service, I'll kind of ask myself, you know, like, what are the most important, you know, attributes in this response? And that just might be in like, maybe you're searching on Google. Right. And like, for instance, you need to make sure and you want to maybe a Google search result returns 20 responses. Right. So like you could set, you know, a test where you kind of just say, like, ensure that you get 20 things, you know, ensure that, you know, you have a valid response when you hit this endpoint. If you're using something like Postman, I think it's good to maybe even just write a test that says, like, verify that there are actually 20 elements of the response. So, I mean, in theory, like you'll have unit coverage and you'll have like maybe some type of integration coverage elsewhere that will cover these things. But I think the difference there is that, say if you're using a tool like Postman or if you, I've also used things like SOAP UI or um, uh, JMeter in the past as well. And those are kind of like work with interfacing, like verify that when you make actual connections to like what you want, like your actual service, whether it's on a staging environment, I prefer it to be on staging environment, not on production, obviously, that you get back what you expect in more detail. So, right, like I think I would, and that's the case where I'd kind of ask yourself, what is the purpose that this query is supposed to deliver? So I think, and rather than just seeing, for me, for instance, like I make a role that always test above status codes, but below func but below full end functionality. So for instance, if it was the idea of the like side inform, I might, I might, and it was just like hitting some endpoint and verifying that there's response. I might say like, you know, test that you hit this response, verify that these two fields, like with this data and verify that these two fields, like an email and password fill are filled out. 
I might not necessarily say specifically, you know, like email value has to equal or password value has to equal this, because I've also found that that leads to failures pretty easily, especially if you're depending on test data, which can be kind of like fuzzy and not guaranteed. But I would say like, think about the business case of the endpoint that you're hitting. And so like always go above status codes, um, but like kind of like below end to end functionality and kind of like find a good middle ground. Um, it's kind of where I've got in terms of like useful testing, because even if you have end to end UI tests, UI tests can sometimes be flaky, but when it comes to more of the debugging purpose, like that's another product case that you might have, like, we don't want to have a large amount of maintenance is, is another use case you could have, right? So like, you might say that, like, it's easier for you to run, you know, like, like these uh, API tests on a more consistent basis, and they take a short amount of time to verify a component of like a larger end to end flow. So that's the case where I would actually kind of be focusing on just like, what is this like endpoint supposed to do? What is the value supposed to be here? And like, see if you can just write a case for that. Um, so that's kind of like where I would kind of focus on there. Um, are there any questions or if there are there any things that uh, I've said that should be more clarified? I would you have one be... more question from Connor. Uh, what kinds of things would be manually tested rather than automatically and vice versa? Um, all right, I guess for me, I would say that like for autom for uh, for when I'm choosing between manual and automated tests, I would say that like I think about that like like the value it, the value the test will bring, and also like the overall focus. So what I mean by that is like say if it's a case of mobile, right? And I might want to test um, the ability for. I guess voice frameworks is a thing that's not new, new, but it's like definitely getting a lot more trash in the past few years. So maybe you're testing the ability to use Siri in your app or the ability to use, um, or the ability to use uh, the, the Google one. I don't know what I'm thinking about, <laughs> but you're testing the ability to kind of, a Google assistant is what you're testing the ability for, right? So that might be a case where, you know, I think, I think as of now, um, the testing frameworks are more mature for both of those for the place to use voice, right? But thinking about the fact that the user case of this thing, I would say that that might be a case where I could say that I might have a bare minimum, you know, amount of uh, like uh, automated test coverage because maybe you're testing like given this query that, you know, you get some response. But the reality is one thing I know, like in my experience from using like, you know, just the Google Home in my house, right? That sometimes if I'm asking for music and it's not, you know, US music, so say if I'm asking for Nigerian music and it can't find the artists, I find that kind of very hard <laughs> to like use as a user. So that's a case where I would, might advocate for more manual testing. Um, and there also are services that will allow you to kind of like expand on manual testing. So if you need to outsource it, I think that is okay. But I would say like for like for automated stuff, I would say automate what you can. That is an easy that is an easy check so you can focus on other things, right? So in the case of the question earlier when they talked about APIs, I would automate checking your error responses, right? Because I don't think that like because I feel like that is an easy check. Like you don't need a client to verify that, you know, like give, give this, you know, maybe you're giving like an endpoint or an API bad data, you should get some error back. Maybe the error is just, you know, 500 and that's fine. Like that's a very simple error. So I would say automate the easy stuff that still, that gives end value. And then what you manually test is that I feel like if you're spending more time trying to maybe test the thing that you want to deliver versus actually, um, I guess a better way to phrase it is if you're spending more time trying to automate a manual test that might not be run on a consistent basis, I recommend do that manually to begin with and then based off your data kind of revisit. So I would say that for manual tests for me, if I, feel like, if I look you know, at different testing frameworks or tools and technologies that are available and there is not an easy way for me to write a test that's gonna involve me doing two to three days of like, you know, figuring out how to write the tests, I always should just kind of be on the side of saying that like, as of right now, I wanna make sure that we can get as much test coverage as possible for what gives the most value. So like, I will focus on doing that. And then I will then follow up and say like, these two to three cases are just really hard to automate, right? So I will just mainly test those. And then maybe a pre like I, we work in um, sprints. So then maybe a previous sprint, like maybe the sprint, usually the sprint right after, um, I will kind of go back and look and say like, all right, like, you know, we did manual testing, we verified and we put that out there. Like, 
but this specific functionality, like I really just cannot, for instance, um, sometimes with sign in there are there's captcha so like you might have it you might run into an issue that if you're using an automated testing framework you, like you can't really get around the fact that it kind of recognizes that it's like a robot testing versus an actual person so in that case i might literally just say that like you know as of right now my test is just going to validate that there are input fields on the screen and then i will validate that actually clicking the button and then i will come back and like look at it again so i would say that like I've seen a lot of cases where, you know, developers or QA engineers try to like write automated tests for things um, and it takes a very long time and the tests are really falsy and they're not reliable. So I say, if you see that pattern, that is something that you want to put as a manual test case. And if the technology is not there for you to actually make it automated, then that is also a good case for a manual case. So like you might say an example for mobile might be um, also using like Android Auto or CarPlay it might be an example. Maybe you just have a really hard time accessing that part of the code base, or you can't get an emulator or simulator up with that screen. So in that case, like if you have access to a car, I think it's a lot easier to um, just in that case kind of say like, hey, you know, like this is a lot harder for us to kind of get a simulator or emulator set up. But like I know locally that I have access to the emulator for um, uh, the dev environment for Android Auto or CarPlay, which there is a dev environment for both. So then I would just do that manually on your own computer versus like relying on doing that automated. So I guess what I guess to kind of like round that, I would say that if it takes you a very long time to write an automated test and then you look back and you know it doesn't provide value, make that as a manual test, but al but always revisit. It. So like that's a point that I don't think I necessarily covered in this in the presentation, but like uh, one thing I find useful is I, I do every six months, three months or four months might be useful for you, but kind of like revisit your tests. By revisit, I don't necessarily mean you have to go through every single test, but if you see there is a case of a test that has been failing over and over and over again, it's unreliable. I'm 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 more the practice of just deleting the test because it's been failing over and over. It's unreliable and no one has pushed up enough to fix it. So it probably is not providing you as much value as you might like. So you can probably just not proceed with that test, but it, you can also decide that like, this is providing us value, but at this time, like we just need to rewrite like what it's really meant to do. So then rewrite it and if not delete it, because in a sense, what that typically leads to is that there's a lot of test maintenance on the road and then people become, they like the test that you have in place for automated tests will become unreliable. If it's a manual test and manual test is wrong, like that also, that also kind of gives user confusion. So if someone like say, for instance, it could be a designer or we've had people from other teams test their application as well and there's a manual test. If the manual test is out of date, like that the manual test becomes unreliable. So I would say that also revisiting your tests every like some, some cycle that works with your team. So it could be every few months, it could be, twice a year, whatever that is, um, is actually a good way to kind of like, kind of keep that in check. Like, cause if you see that something that you automated is just not reliable, you're like, this might just need to be a manual test that we kind of run every few months or something. So basically to summarize it, it would depend on what you're testing and also the methodology to make sure it still applies and it works. Yeah, so, so yeah, so in, in a nutshell, like it depends on what you're testing. And I would say that like, um, I would I would encourage you to if there's a way to automate and automate doesn't have to be through code it could be automate through there are other tools that we view like Rainforest or um, sourcing out testing or even having teams internally or just times where we just do it regardless of whoever is testing right my thought is that like anything that is easy to do that provides value automate that first and then focus on the manual testing and what you learn from the automated testing should inform your uh, what you learn from manual testing should inform your manual what you learned from manual testing should inform your automated test. So if you find that there are more cases that come out of manual testing that are easy to put in, put it in. If not, then just make a time on your team or interval where you think makes sense to kind of do that manual testing. And as technology matures or as there are more tools made available to do it easier, then kind of use those tools to kind of gain more coverage then.